Hockey here, boys. It's uh, one of our favorites, Mike Florio from ProFootballTalk.com, doing a radio and TV uh, for the NBC Sports Network family. NBC. Can I just say something right out yeah, of the gate? Yeah, good morning. I often wonder from time to time yeah. whether you've changed your format to a music station. You take okay. full advantage of just letting that music bed play. Mm, sometimes. Like for three minutes. Like, I'm thinking, is this yeah. like... Is this FM, uh, you know, cool rock. R&B? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, what in the world? But you, you've got it worked out. You figure out how to steal money. No, it's the... By it's, talking as little as possible. It's Well, there is that. That's what the listeners want, It's like. the It's the multifaceted platform status that through which we all navigate, where if the tweeting to promote a segment is coming up next, and in deleterious fashion, I wait too long to do it, to get the KFAN.com slash listen crowd involved, the music will play an additional 45 seconds. Did you just say deleterious? Correct, I did. Can you put that microphone a little closer to your mouth? I'd actually, I think, can you put yours a little farther away? I think I think by now in your broad chasing, I mean broadcasting career, you would know proper microphone placements. <laughs> hey, I, I, your ears should have tingled a little bit ago. Why? Because we had J.K. Dobbins, the Ohio State running back, okay. on set, and we were playing some of his high school highlights because we are very prepared for these people who would be interviewing, unlike you. Of course you are. And I I uttered a he's loose. Why? Oh. Because it's it, it's an homage to you. Awesome. It's something that maybe one person would have gotten, but it was worth it. The um of uh, the aforementioned running back, with all due respect, I couldn't pick out of a two person lineup standing next to Toby Gerhardt. So I will ask, <laughs> is he a potential and he's loose guy? Yes. Like he has that to yes. him. Yes. Whoa. Yeah. They all are at the, at the high school level. It's amazing how dominant the, like, like I, I've asked several of them when we watch these highlights. Do you ever feel guilty? Like this is yeah, too right. Easy. <laughs> it's too easy. Yeah, right? Right. And then when they get to college, they get popped by like Nick Bosa. Then it all changes. Well, how, yeah. how about Leonard Fournette? Do you ever watch his high, his high school yeah. highlight tape? It wasn't fair. Really? No. It Derek was, Henry too. Yeah. Der- it wasn't man fair. among boys. Oh yeah, yeah. They, yeah. By absurd. far and away. The best player on the field and the most aggressive player on the field. One of the best highlight packages I ever saw. It didn't involve football. It was Haloti Nada playing rugby. <laughs> what? Where, oh, yeah, boy. It, it, really? looked, it looked Jeez. like a professional wrestler <laughs> showed up at a five-year-old soccer match <laughs> and just went out there and started throwing them around. It's like, it's like Andy Reid's pump <laughs> pass. <and yeah. laughs> yeah, from the Coliseum in Southern California. Love that. Or IED. Hey, um, uh, Vikings inclusion on your glitzy set, whether radio, TV, or radio and TV. Zimmer, Spielman, both, one or the other, who have you had? Well, we got Spielman. Okay. We always get Spielman. And the planets have to line up just right to get right. Zimmer. Um, it's was, just the way it is. So was um so with the but G- you get Zimmer. With the GM was Stefan Diggs and the speculation a pertinent topic. I told Rick Spielman in honor of the seventh anniversary of the Percy Harvey trade to look into the <laughs> camera and say we have no intent to trade Stefan Diggs. Wow. And he wouldn't. He, he said Stefan Diggs is a Viking. Yeah. And, yes, present tense, he is a Viking. Okay. That's all he says. Well, Stock when, answer. when we got into it yesterday, he ended the interview by saying, why wouldn't he be with us next year? So he kind of left that open, too. But what, yeah. what was your approach with that? Well, like, I, do you think he's going to be traded? Because I don't. Well, I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, you look at, I think I crunched the numbers. It would, cre- uh, it would clear, what, $10 million in cash and maybe not nearly as much in cap space because I have to take the acceleration. Right. For the for the bonus money that still needs to hit the cap, yeah. But I, I, look, it wouldn't shock me. I mean, there is this weird sense that pops up from time to time that Stefan wants something other than what he has, and mm-hmm. then it goes away. It happened after the Bears game, mm-hmm. and then it went away. And when we talked to him before the Super the one after I the Bears game was sense. bad. I didn't get any sense from him when we saw him at the Super Bowl that he had any desire to be with the team other than the Vikings, but you just never know. And then yeah. how much money can you plunk into the position? And part of it is, also, how do you feel about the guys behind him? You know, the guys behind Stephon Diggs and Adam Thielen, as of right now, I mean, I like what B.C. Johnson can do, but it's not like they have a huge stable no. of young, cheap players who can justify saying, sorry, Stephon, we've done everything we can, we just can't. We can't have this kind of number on our books. Now, if you were playing GM, though, what do you think is the sensible thing to do? Well, you always look, every, you know, there's nobody who's untouchable, right? right? And and if you think that there is a way to make it happen, you try to make it happen without putting a for sale sign in the yard, just so you get that offer, so you get that call. And if the, you know, it depends on what your other on, on what your other objectives are. But they need to create some cap space, right? They clearly need to do it. And you know, we pressed him on Kirk Cousins, and whether or not Kirk Cousins will be extended. You know, you can extend Kirk Cousins and take a huge chunk out of his cap 
obligation right. for 2020. And, and probably get 12 positions. to 15 this year for right. those other positions. Right. So I, I think that, you know, they need to make that long-term decision about what they're going to do with Kirk Cousins. And I don't know. I, you know, I've sounded this out with you before. You've got Mike Zimmer last year, the contract, Chris, uh, Rick Spielman, not Chris, in the last year, the contract, Dalvin Cook and Kirk Cousins. And maybe the smart play is to say we're not signing anybody to a new contract here's the carrot go chase it if you get it you get it uh and that's a good problem to have if you don't then we've got maximum flexibility because the worst thing they could do is sign kirk cousins to another long-term deal and then after this year let's say that you know it's the what's it been under zimmer playoffs no playoffs playoffs no playoffs what if we continue that track and it's no playoffs this year and after we just say well we need to go a different way we need a quarterback with more mobility and and you're stuck with Kirk Cousins' contract for the next three years, uh, that, that's, that's the challenge. But if you wait, it could cost a lot more to keep him because the market's going to blow north of $40 million soon. Yeah. And, and the next coach, if, 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 it, if it does bottom out, the next coach might not want Kirk. And so if you don't have Kirk under contract, you're bringing a coach who can then bring in his quarterback that he wants to be married to. Uh, every coach wants his own quarterback, yes. unless you're Tony Dungy falling into Peyton Manning. Yeah. Right? Right. right? You want your own guy. And, and, and the, you know, I, one thing that we pressed... Rick on was the the concept of you know you look at look at the Chiefs with Patrick Mahomes. There's two plays: the play they call, and then the play he pulls out of thin air right. or other other places when it all falls apart. For Kirk, there's the play they call. Yeah. And when it all falls apart, it's over, and that's fine. Mm-hmm. That's fine, but th- there's got to be a temptation at some level to get yourself one of these guys that can extend the play a little bit longer and and actually make something happen when the way it's drawn up because you could say and you know rick said well you know if the offensive lineman misses his block and 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 there's a guy in kirk's face is it kirk's fault well no it's not but if you're a guy who can run away from that and make something happen then that's maybe the guy that you want to try to get not that they're well i I everywhere that's i guess that was my point is that you compare him to any quarterback, to a guy like Patrick Mahomes, and it's like he, he's got one of the most unique skill sets in the NFL right now when it comes to quarterback. And, and yeah, you'd love to have a guy that's going to extend some plays, but very few guys have that arm strength. Very few guys have, have the vision that he has and the accuracy to throw on the run and throw you know, from different arm angles and stuff like that. So it's easy to say right now on paper, yeah, let's find a guy with more mobility. Well, teams right. have tried that, right. and it doesn't always work. Well, I know, but there are plenty of guys coming out now from the – college ranks that I, I think this willingness by NFL coaches to not try to jam the square peg into the round hole and say this guy's got to fit my system mm-hmm. but look here's the guy we're getting we know what he can do instead of trying to mold him let's mold our approach to let him do what he did and and there are you know there are plenty of quarterbacks now who can use their legs to extend the play and and I know that's and you know I know guys have won Super Bowls there's one guy who's won six without the ability to to extend the play laterally, but you know when uh, Tom Brady's anticipation is such that he senses the walls closing in, he can step up, step to the left, step to the right, and get rid of the football. For for Kirk, you know he doesn't have the ability to run away from the pressure, and he also lacks that instinct of Tom Brady to know the pressure's coming and to get rid of the football quickly. Um, you know, to a guy who's open. I think back on that, the, the fourth down play against the Seahawks, and they, you know, so he, he the, the two guys ran deep, and there were two outs on the inside slot by tight ends. I mean, that really wasn't an ideal play to run, but you know, it, it you 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 want to give him a system that gives him a chance to find a guy before it all falls apart, and then he has to do it before it all falls apart. It's Florio from PFT from the Combine Charge. Uh, two quick things on what you were just talking about. Number one, Kirk's not a statue, and he was really successful when they rolled him out in boots. And you know, unless little... unless they saw it coming, and they had a guy in his face like San Francisco did every right, time right, they right, did that roll and, and it, it it can it can get blown up for yeah. sure. But he had a lot of success there. And the other thing you were talking about how coaches are getting better at working with the the quarterbacks they've got. Look at Greg Roman. If some other team had taken Lamar Jackson and just tried to make him into you know pocket passer guy and somebody who isn't going to run fifteen times a game, you don't have the crazy success that he's got. So I, I think there's a lot to be said for that. I can't help but wonder how much better Mike Vick would have been in this day and age where oh, yeah. Yeah. you just say, 
And, and it, it isn't it amazing it took so long for people to figure out? This isn't like discovering plutonium. Right. This is this is what he does. Let's do what, what he, he does, does best. And yeah. let's not do what he doesn't do well, and it all yeah. works out. You think, uh, um, you, you think the NFL would ever take any of the rules or any of the dynamic things from the XFL? I, I hope they take the kickoff. Yeah. I mm-hmm. think there's a lot of crow that would need to be eaten for them to take the kickoff yeah. from the XFL because they've been trying for 10 years to first make the kickoff more safe by making it less irrelevant. irrelevant. Right, right. Yes. So there's no returns. Like, right. okay, this is an unsafe play. How do we make it safer? We do it less frequently. No, that's not how you make it safer. And then yeah. they finally did the redesign that's aimed at making it safer. The running start is eliminated. You don't have mm-hmm. that, that huge high-impact collision that you used to have. But this, the, the XFL kickoff is a thing of beauty. And I hate, I hate <laughs> to keep it this low-tech. It reminds me of electric football. Right? <laughs> when you've got, yeah. you've got 20 guys yeah. Yeah. five yards apart, yeah. and they're motionless. And you've got and the, the bases in the set air. up nicely. Yeah. Yeah. Everything's ready. The yeah. ball's in the air. The guy catches it, and that's yeah. the moment that the kid hits, hits that the button. switch, right. and off yeah. they go. But, I but love that. If yeah. you perceive the NFL to have any hierarchy-like arrogance, then it would be tough conceding. Never, ever. You came up with something better than us. And, and and we're going to take that. Yeah, because here's the problem. They may get this question anyway, but the competition committee has to report to the owners. And it doesn't take many owners to say, guys, you've been coming up with ideas for the last 10 years on how to make this safer and how to make it more effective. <laughs> and th- this XFL kickoff like, what the hell? Why didn't <laughs> we think of this? And, and I hope that the pride and the ego gets set aside. Mark Murphy, the Packers CEO, who's on the competition committee, has said he's intrigued by it. They haven't had formal discussions, which implies they've had informal discussions. And I'd love to see them do it. I would love to see them do it. Uh, it looks like we're nearing completion on a potential CBA, a full year ahead of when it would expire. And you know, credit both sides for getting to the table way in advance of this thing getting ugly. And uh, it sounds like they're going to be presenting, the NFLPA is going to be presenting to its membership the opportunity to vote on this. Do we, what do you know that's in this new CBA that represents a change from, from what's happening now in the well, CBA? Well, 17 games. The, 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 the whole focus and a buy. is 17, it's, not, it's still one buy, not still two. Still one buy. Okay. Still one buy, right. not two. Okay, good. The networks don't want two buys because when you put in two buys, you start really diluting some of the weekends. So you're going to look at the schedule and say, oh, my God, what am I going to watch this week in November yeah. and December? Okay. Mm-hmm. But the 17 games was the biggest sticking point. And what happened was... The NFLPA Executive Committee, along with Executive Director DeMora Smith, spent 10 months negotiating based on 17 games. They reached an agreement based on 17 games. Well, it's, and, and the example I've used, Paul, and I may have said it on your show, I apologize if I'm repeating myself. If you've got a lawsuit and there's two lawyers and they're, they're talking and they come up with an agreement, okay, fine, this resolution is acceptable to us. Now we have to go sell it to our clients. Right. The NFL sold it. To its clients, the NFLPA had a hell of a time mm-hmm. selling this thing. I mean, the executive committee that, that negotiated the deal voted 6-5 to five against it on Friday and 7-4 to four against it last night. Wow. And the board of player reps barely passed this thing through to allow it to go to the full membership for a 50% plus one vote, yep. which, you know, it's about 1,900 players. So what's that, about 950 you're going to have to mm-hmm. say yes to it. They think that's what will happen. But, you know, I think D. Smith was an advocate of this deal all along because he fears that if they don't take advantage of the opportunity to get a deal done now, pivot to the networks, and lock in long-term TV deals, there's going to be less total money for everyone, or or there's going to be less total money, and that shortfall is going to come out of the pockets of the players, not the mm-hmm. league, when they do the deals when they finally get labor peace. I think that's why there's urgency to do it now. Right. So, uh, so this is obviously a former player's... Um, take on it but i didn't see when i was looking at the bullet points any sort of headway when it comes to health insurance after their playing career it's five years of post post career health insurance coverage and then that's it and i i found i found it you know really really irresponsible i think by by everybody involved that that wasn't even a a negotiating point you know i they didn't even ask an increase in a year or two you yeah. know, and it's and they're but they're also going to get a percent to a percent and a half of extra uh, all revenue, which equates to what five billion dollars or something like that. And they and they yet they couldn't find anything for former players. Well, and see that's what it comes down to, Ben. There is a certain pot of money that they are willing to devote to the players, what, whatever that maximum is. And who knows? Would there have been more later? I mean, there are devices available to the players that they could have chosen to try to pursue. I, maybe this time around a lockout wouldn't have been as effective for the owners because you got some 
elderly and older owners like a Jerry Jones desperate to win a Super Bowl? Do you really think he's going to shut down football for a year? Right. The antitrust litigation, which used to be centered in Minnesota, it happened mm-hmm. with the Reggie White case, and that mm-hmm. was the, the impetus for the the CBA in 1993 that gave the players something close to real free agency. Antitrust litigation would be a powerful weapon. The question is, do you want to go down that path? So whatever the maximum pot of money is that the NFL will will give the players, what you do with it, that's yeah, that's basically up to the players. Like, what do you prioritize? Is it money in your in your regular salary? Is it funding for lifetime health care? What? How do you want to carve this up? You know, I'm surprised retired players are getting more under this deal because it's very easy for the union to say. And I remember Gene Upshaw said this years ago. I represent the current players, not the former players. And if the, the former players don't like what they're getting by way of pension, they should have negotiated a better deal when they were playing. So, you know, every dollar that goes to this, to this, to this, to this, that's that, that all comes out of the same pot. Charchi, last one. Quick hitters. Uh, preseason, number of preseason games in the new deal? It'll be three. Three, bummer. So it's still maybe three too many. Uh, it is the discipline path going outside of Roger Goodell. The, the proposal, as I understood it, was the first decision for personal conduct policy violations would be made by a neutral third party. Mm. Goodell would be responsible for the appeal. And some people say, well, that's really not that good. Well, the person who makes the first decision has a ton of power because yeah. that person shapes what even is available for sure to be uh, handled on appeal. So so I think it's probably better for the players to have the first decision made by, by someone other than the commissioner. And lastly, expanded playoffs. In? Uh, yeah, it's in. And and look, they were going to do it anyway, supposedly. I still think they needed agreement of the NFLPA. Uh, we've talked to coaches for the past two days. There isn't a single one that's against it. Because you know what? They all if, you're play playoff coaches. if you're facing... Yes. A playoffs or your yes. fired mandate, <laughs> yeah. you got another right. shot to get in. Mm. They're not worried about being the two seed and losing their bye, right. which they should be. Yeah. Right? Because yeah. I think it's going to, here's what's going to happen. We're going to have five years of this, and the one seeds are going to be predominantly the representatives of each conference in the Super Bowl, and then the fans are going to say, this isn't fair. We need to have 16 teams in the playoffs. And yeah, the NFL is right. going to say, well, if you insist. Yeah, right, right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's going to happen. Uh, thank you very much. Hey, good seeing you. I appreciate you. the time. Paul, you too, ma'am. Thanks for joining me for dinner last night. It was great seeing you there. No problem. Um, yeah. Always uh, always my pleasure. Uh, Mike Florio, ProFootballTalk.com. Uh, when we See return, buddy. Cleveland Browns head coach Kevin Stefanski joins us from the 2020 Combine. Uh, this is courtesy of Whiting Clinic uh, LASIK and Eye Care and WhitingClinic.com. Back after this. You're listening.